Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Manitoba Premier Wab Kanu says a Winnipeg serial killer who was sentenced on Wednesday should never be free again. Jeremy Skibitsky was sentenced to a mandatory life sentence with no chance for parole for 25 years. In the homicides of Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, Rebecca Contois, and Mashkode Bizikikwe, or Buffalo Woman. During an unrelated news conference today, Canoe thanked the families and said he personally called them and other advocates after the sentencing. Canoe says the families did something incredibly important for the province and for the country. The Manitoba Premier says he went for a run this morning with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and provided the PM an update on the landfill search. Canoe will be doing a walkthrough of the Prairie Green landfill tomorrow. An announcement on further ways to prevent similar homicides from happening in the future is slated for next week. The Premier was also repeatedly pressed about a Supreme Court ruling that allows for multiple murder convictions to be served concurrently rather than consecutively. So I have to respect the justice system, the administration of justice as handed, handled by people like Justice Royale. I also have a tremendous amount of respect for the Supreme Court of Canada. What I would say in response to the issue that you're trying to press is that this person can never be allowed to see the light of day as a free person in our country again. The crimes that were committed, the terrible actions which are now part of this person's vocabulary means that they can never be free again. And I'm not entertaining exceptions to that. So we spoke to family members yesterday and they said we need to remember this. When this person applies for parole in the future, this needs to be reminded uh, of people entertaining you know, those hearings and stuff like that. I hope I'm not overstepping here by saying that, but I don't think there's too many Manitobans who are going to argue with me when I say this person can never be free again. Grand Chief Kathy Merrick of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs was at the sentencing hearing for a Winnipeg serial killer on Wednesday. We spoke with her earlier today during our first newscast. Here's part of that interview. Grand Chief, you spoke yesterday. We heard some of your reaction immediately after the sentencing. Um, you know, now that you've had a little bit more time to process everything, um, what's been going through your mind? It was uh, it was very bittersweet in terms of uh, being able to hear what uh, Justice Glenn jo Joyal uh, said at the sentencing and to be able to hear that uh, the, the serial killer was going to get uh, 25 years and hopefully that's a lifetime for him. And uh, we can't always be forgiving as a people when it comes to our, um, our women and our uh, vulnerable women that are out there and that uh, I was happy uh, that he did get the 25 years. Should have been more, obviously, and, uh, but that's be, uh, beyond our control. So um, I'm happy that he's gonna be in jail for the next 25 years. But that shouldn't stop at, at that as well because it sets uh, a clear precedent mm. in terms of uh, that, we're no longer going to tolerate violence against our women in the province of Manitoba. And that's something that we have worked hard on to be able to, to ensure that, uh, that, that we are here and that we, we have a voice now. And we have a very lo loud voice here in the province of Manitoba, as well as in Canada. And, uh, and that's something that we have said and that's something that we have, uh, that we hold the province accountable to as well. 
You, you mentioned the concurrent life sentences. Uh, Chief Justice Joy Al even touched on that, and you know that having to rely really on the parole board uh, years from now, which hasn't always been that reliable. I think uh, we can say as well. But does AMC have any plans to uh, pursue perhaps uh, changes to the law in the future, so that the you know anyone who does these types of crimes target Indigenous women racially, um, they, they wouldn't be concurrent. Yes, yes hopefully that's something that uh, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs can can pursue and can work on within within a period of time so that, uh, that it never happens again and that uh, everybody that's uh, being charged has to be accountable to what they're being charged with. Mm. He killed four women and he should uh, he should be able to charge him for the four lives and for the four uh, lives that he took speaking of chief joel you know there were some uh, different things this time around uh, in the way that the courtroom was set up things that happened in the courtroom uh, providing time for victim and community impact statements so how do you feel that uh, chief justice joel handled this trial he handled it uh, really well for giving an opportunity to, to myself as well as through uh, for the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs as well as to the, uh, to the, to the impacted families and it, it was very, um, it was very good to be able to say what we needed to say and that uh, it have, as, as a leader from the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs I, I speak on behalf of First Nations, and what happened, um, it uh, brought an awareness to the uh, long outstanding issue of uh, genocide in this country when it comes to our missing and murdered Indigenous women. And nobody really wants to say that, right? But it's the truth. And, and that's something that, uh, that we need to ensure for our, um, for our youth, our young people, that they be very much aware and they be very much uh, be able to speak to, to the issues that we, that we bring to them, that they learn them, that this should never ever happen again in this good country of ours that we call Canada. Uh, Grand Chief, uh, lastly here, you, you've been on the front lines of this uh, for since the beginning, uh, you know, criticizing police, criticizing Premier Canoe uh, when things weren't getting done. Uh, I guess, what has, uh, why has this last uh, few years been so important for you to remain on this and what's been the impact on yourself? It's been really hard and not hard in the way of the work. It's a uh, hard work and uh, for myself as, a, as a, the leader of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, being a woman and being a mother and seeing the impacts that it has on, on the families that you just want to be there to, to be able to comfort them. In, in what they're struggling and what they're going through. So that was really hard for me to, to be able to do that. But it wasn't hard for me to, uh, to, to go to government and to, to ensure that uh, they be able to fund the landfill search and whatnot. And so we were there and uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the Premier did state prior to him becoming premier that that was one of the things that he would do as a, a premier was to uh, search the landfill and so we did all the work and we went to Ottawa, we went to the province to be able to ensure that uh, the search was going to happen. So we're there now and hopefully that the search will happen within a short period of time. Well, Grand Chief, I know a lot of people have looked to you for your leadership on this, and uh, there's much more work to do ahead in the days to come, but uh, appreciate you taking some time for us here today. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dennis. In other news, the Six Nations Police Service has charged a 58-year-old with possession of child pornography. In a press release, police say the Six Nations resident appeared in a Brantford court Wednesday. The accused is being held in custody. 
pending a bail hearing. Charges stem from a joint investigation between Six Nations Police and the Ontario Provincial Digital Forensic Unit. Police say the investigation is ongoing and further charges may be coming. They also say no further information will be released at this time due to a court-ordered publication ban. In a separate press release, Indigenous Services Deputy Minister Gina Wilson called this disturbing news and that they'll do everything in their power to best support the community. Coming up after the break, our Truth and Politics panel will be here to discuss the sentencing of a Winnipeg serial killer and a delay on the vote for that massive child welfare reform package. Stick around. a busy week with two major developments. On Wednesday, as you've been hearing, a Winnipeg serial killer sentenced for killing four Indigenous women. Earlier in the week, the Assembly of First Nations announced a delay in the vote on a $47 billion child welfare reform package. Here to provide their opinions is our Truth and Politics panel. Jennifer Laywitz is a partner with Pasqua Harbour Strategies and Egon Sinclair is a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press. Negan, Jennifer, great to see you as always. Uh, Negan, we'll start with you and uh, your reflections on yesterday and the sentencing of uh, a Winnipeg serial killer. At the moment of sentencing, after uh, a long series of hearing of impact statements and uh, other really important things that the community had to share. Uh, Ch Chief Justice, or former Chief Justice, Court of King's Bench Justice J Glenn Joyal asked uh, now convicted uh, serial killer Jeremy Skibicki to stand, asked three times, he refused. Finally, when his defense attorney told him to stand, he did. Uh, that is the perfect embodiment of Canada's treatment of this issue uh, in ball, embodied by this horrific trial. Uh, the fact is that at the end of all of this, a serial killer was allowed to uh, perpetrate terrible, horrible crimes, almost got away with it, and if it wasn't for the fact that uh, there was a long-standing series of activists, uh, very loud people in the media, uh, people who were uh, making sure that police were held to account, uh, there probably would be more cases like this. Every province has a case that looks like the Skibiki trial, uh, whether it be a serial killer or not. There is an epidemic of violence against Indigenous women and girls, and we must speak about it. It is not suitable for this country to continue to refuse to take action on this issue. Uh, Jennifer, your thoughts on what transpired yesterday and maybe uh, your thoughts on the need for, there's been calls for change to the law in this concurrent sentencing. Um, I think that yesterday was a, a really monumental day for the families. Um, this is probably a day that they've been waiting for for some time, especially as the trial process went through. but. Nigon is right in the fact that I, I think about the advocacy that the family has had to do and the emotional toll that that has taken to not only fight for justice for their their missing and murdered loved ones, but for fighting for the equality of, of Indigenous women and to be taken seriously. And, you know, this issue has been ongoing in this country for a very, very long time and all levels of government need to have their eyes on this. And, you know, the concurrent sentencing at the end of the day, I read the article that said he's able to apply for parole when he's 60 years old. Mm -hmm. And he still will have life left after that. And these family members are never coming home. So, you know, I'm not opposed to relooking at the law when it comes to people that, you know, commit heinous crimes and being able to serve their, their sentences concurrently like this. Uh, Jennifer Negan, turning to uh, another big issue that's come up this week in the news, and that's the delay of the meeting and the vote on the $48 billion child welfare reform package. Uh, Negan, what are your thoughts on the delay? Uh, I think when we look back, uh, let's say a year, maybe two, three, maybe even five years from now, uh, this will be the moment that in uh, now national chief, former regional chief in charge of this portfolio issue, uh, Cindy Woodhouse, 
Uh, this is an issue in which she has put a great amount of energy in taking leadership on this, oftentimes taking away from the work of Cindy Blackstock, who held this issue for such a long period of time. And because the AFN took such a strong, I'll say aggressive approach in getting this deal done, uh, you missed many of the steps that Cindy Blackstock had been concerned about on the way, consultation, making sure the right people are at the table, and then finally when the parameters of the agreement are forged, agreeing to certain things that just we've seen chiefs outright rejecting, the regional chiefs being only one of many voices that are rejecting that issue, but also Cindy Blackstock herself. And uh, while the national chief has now been about eight months in office, this is the sign, I think, of a real rebuke of the way in which she's doing business at the AFN. And it's going to continue. This is going to, as the, the agreement is going to be delayed for months now, will be a very serious problem going forward for the AFN at large. Uh, Jennifer, this is a file close to your heart and work. Uh, what are you hearing and what's your take on this delay on the vote? Um, yeah, Bill C-92 has been something that I've been watching right from the beginning as a First Nations kid that was apprehended as an infant. And I I don't look at so much as our, our chiefs are delaying and so much as they are spending more time considering. And, you know, Bill C-92 and child welfare is the closest that our nations have been to sovereignty since the Indian Act domesticating us. And this issue is is huge. And, you know, I, I look at someone like Cindy Blackstock as, as a warrior for our people and somebody that has the best interests of First Nations kids in care at the forefront of everything that she does. And when she comes out, and number one, she wasn't included in this process, and comes out, you know, having at decades of advocacy on this issue and saying, listen, this deal is not what you think it is. And I think we need to reconsider, you know, where, where our leadership is at on accepting this deal. That is monumental. And I think that there are a lot of, you know, excellent concerns being raised by leadership that Negon echoed in terms of consultation and transparency and the clause that AFN needs to promote this um, within the deal. But also the fact that, you know, where, where like where where do we go from here you know their nations are ready to get to work on this issue but at the same time do, should we undercut what we're, we're rightfully owed and take a deal that maybe isn't in the best representation of our people jennifer nego and we'll have to leave there always appreciate your opinions thanks for being with us yeah, thank you much. Thanks. treaties one through eleven are being honored at a gathering in alberta that story and more still to come Welcome back. Time for our photo of the day. Longtime viewer Clarence Jones was able to enjoy the northern lights in full effect to illuminate the night sky in Gitsan territory. A beautiful shot. Thanks, Clarence. You can submit your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Friday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, sunny and 22 in Halifax, 24 under sunny skies in Fredericton. Cloudy and 19 for Kujuwak and Nain. 27 in Montreal, 24 under sunny skies in Shibugamu. Showers and 22 in Sault Ste. Marie, 25 with rain in North Bay. 25 in Thunder Bay, rain and 23 in Sioux Lookout. 20 with showers for Thompson, God's Lake and Norway House. Sunny skies and 24 in Winnipeg, 23 in Dauphin. 26 in Regina, 25 in Saskatoon. 22 for Meadow Lake and La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, 19 with showers in Fort Chippewan, 18 in Fort McMurray. Rain and 23 in Edmonton, 29 for Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. Sunny and 23 in Vancouver, sun's out in 31 for Kamloops. 21 with rain in Prince George, 19 in Smithers, 9 with showers in Old Crow, 16 in Whitehorse, rain and 17 for Yellowknife, 18 in Wrigley, a high of just plus 2 in Saks Harbor, 15 in Politech, 9 for Baker Lake, Chesterfield and Whale Cove, 3 in Resolute, 7 in Arctic Bay. Cold Lake First Nation and Beaver Lake Cree Nation in Alberta are hosting a Treaty 1 to 11 outdoor gathering this week. 
Hundreds of people from across Canada are there to honour and respect the traditional way of doing things. APTN's Chris Stewart was there and talked to some of those in attendance. People from Treaties 1 to 11 are gathering at the English Bay Treaty Grounds, just north of the city of Cold Lake, Alberta. The five-day event is intended to share expertise from elders, leaders and knowledge keepers and to get different perspectives about treaties and protecting the rights spelled out in them. Willis Jeanvier is a Dene language podcaster from Saskatchewan. He spoke Wednesday on hearing voices from youth. He says the gathering is important to gain new knowledge from each other. I think the goal is to bring people together and learn from each other how we can enforce treaty with government or to teach the young people about treaty and to pass on that knowledge and the teachings, right? And a lot of the elders also talk about protocol and languages, and having these brought back in our schools for, for the young people to have access to. Geraldine and Amy Ann Gauthier drove 12 hours from the Soto First Nations in Treaty 8 territory in British Columbia to be here. This is one of the biggest uh, treaty meetings that I've ever been to with all the treaties here, 1 to 11. Yeah, I'm enjoying myself now and there's a lot of great speeches there and stories. Yeah, it's really a lot of fun. Amy Ann Gauthier says it's important to continue to press the government to recognize Indigenous rights. What the elders have been asking for from the federal government for many times, for, for many years regarding, you know, the safeguard for the for elders, First Nations and the people ourselves, uh, that's, that's a really a very important part of it. Yes, yeah, you know, having, having our own jurisdiction over, over a lot of matters that uh, the, the government has not played any part of. Yeah, or they, they acknowledge. They, yeah, they don't acknowledge what we've, we've always been trying to do. Wednesday's theme focused on youth. Shiloh Chief is a young man from Saskatchewan. He spent his youth in foster care. I'm actually here to reconnect and to be able to uh, get back to the roots. Um, you know, it's been a long journey and, you know, being here, it's a lot of powerful energy and, you know, positive, uh, positive resilience that, you know, I feel when I'm around here, I get to meet new faces and especially after a long time of, you know, being in care and stuff like that. Uh, it's extraordinary to know that I have a lot of relatives all around. 12-year-old Miguan says he is having a blast here. I'm doing like some activities here. Yesterday we went kayaking, nature rock, fire starting, then um, after, and um, yeah, and um, I do. I went singing here last night, and then um, yeah, I had a great time. The gathering ends Friday with a powwow beginning at noon and running into the night. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, English Bay, Treaty Grounds, Alberta. Looks like a great time. Thanks for heading out there, Chris. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For much more, you can head on over to our website, aptnnews.ca. And I will see you back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for your first look at Friday's news. And we will also be celebrating a special milestone here as APTN set to turn 25 years old. We'll see you then. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Thanks for being with us. Have a great day.